no, it's fine. I got it. Your phone? Yeah. Al Fatiha. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضال سلق الله العلي العظيم أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولا إمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله ثم الصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم مصطفى محمد من صلى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما دخلوا على يوسف آوى إليه أبويه وقال ادخلوا مصر إن شاء الله آمنين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم ما سلي على محمد وآل محمد أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala There is no doubt that it's due to his kindness and generosity that he provides for us opportunities such as these where we gather together in remembrance of him tabaraka wa ta'ala Alhamdulillah, inshaAllah, tonight we will finish the tafsir of Surah Yusuf, inshaAllah. Maybe many of you are thinking are still tafsir of Surah Yusuf. Um, but this is the barakah of Shahru Ramadan. And inshaAllah, we have carried it on for a month and a half and we'll be finishing it off tonight, inshaAllah. So we are at nearly the end of the surah. The surah has about 111 verses, I believe. 111 or 112 verses. And... Uh, the story of Prophet Yusuf salam begins in verse 4 and ends in verse 101. So we'll finish the story today. The last part of the surah, the last 10 verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly addressing Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So where we've reached to the story now, if you remember, is that Yusuf alayhi salam identifies himself to his brothers. He says, I am Yusuf. They are excited to meet one another. They, the brothers now tell him the plight of their father, that he has lost his eyesight because of grief. He has become old and tired. So Yusuf alayhi salam says, take my shirt to our father and inshallah he will regain his eyesight and he will regain his strength. One of the beautiful verses which comes in surah, verse number um, 94 of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا فَصَلَتِ الْعِيرُ قَالَ أَبُوهُمْ إِنِّي لَأَجِدُ رِيحَ Yusuf. Um, I find this a very beautiful verse. And it says, as the caravan set off, their father said, I sense the scent of Yusuf. Yeah, so they were still in Misr. And now they lived in Kan'an. Yaqub alayhi salam lived in Kan'an which was, we said, a 17-day journey to go from Misr to Kan'an. And as soon as they left Misr, the father says, I can smell Yusuf alayhi salam. Um, now, what is very interesting is Yusuf had always been there. Yeah? So he could have scented him or smelt him at any time, but this was how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted there to be a separation between them as a test for everybody, the brothers as a test for Yusuf, as a test for Yaqub alayhi salam. Now the brothers finally reach back to Kanaan. They give the shirt to their father. The father regains the eyesight. And now the father and the family is excited because Yusuf alayhi salam had invited them all to go to Misr. So 
here we get to the scenario where now the city of Canaan, especially the house of Yaqub السلام, is filled once again with light. It is filled once again with laughter and happiness and joy because for a long time the house was a house of sadness. Because Yaqub was sad, um, nobody could cheer their father up. But now knowing that his sons are alive and his sons are doing well, once again there is happiness and joy in the Prophet's house. The family begins to prepare for their journey and towards Misr. But unlike the last time that they went, if you remember, the sons last time went in a, with a sense of shame. This time they were not going in that sense. They were not shameful, uh, nor were they embarrassed in any way. They were going proud as the guests of the Amir of Misr. So they were personal guests of um, the Amir of Misr. The journey was long, you can imagine, when you're anticipating something, right? Um, it's a 17-day journey, a day and night, the anticipation is building to meet Yusuf alayhi salam. On the other side, in Misr, Yusuf alayhi salam as well is very excited at the arrival of his father. Yeah. Um, in fact, we are told that he waits outside the city gates to welcome his father. This shows the level of enjoyment and excitement and respect that Yusuf السلام, was showing his father Yaqub. The Holy Quran describes this scenario and, he's, and it says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Falamma dakhalu ala Yusuf awa ilayhi abawai. When they entered the presence of Joseph, he took his parents into his arms. Yani he embraced his parents. Um, we can only imagine how maybe 40 years some Mufassirun say that the father and son had not met. Um, if our child goes away for school for 10 months out of the year, how excited we get to have them back home. Um, if our child goes to school for 8 hours, we are excited to have them back home. Um, imagine a separation of 40 years where they have not seen each other, the kind of excitement and joy they must have been feeling. Then Yusuf alayhi salam turns to the rest of the family and says, وَقَالَ ادْخُلُوا مِصْرَ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهِ آمِنِينَ And said, welcome to Egypt in safety, God willing. إن شاء الله آمِنِينَ In safety. This is where the Mufassirun say, the word that is used is ادْخُلُوا. ادْخُلُوا means enter. Yeah? Um, it has been translated as welcome. Again, this is the problem with translations sometimes, but it means enter into Egypt. And this is why they say that Yusuf waited outside the city, because once you are in the city, he wouldn't say enter the city. Right? So he was outside the city waiting for them and said to them, enter in safety. And the fact that he said, Aminin was a sense of security for the brothers. Remember, these are the same brothers who had betrayed Yusuf um, tremendously. But now he says, don't worry, inshallah, you will be safe in this city. As soon as they entered the castle, Yusuf alayhi salam honored his family and especially his parents when Allah says, وَرَفَعَ عَبَوَيْهِ عَلَى الْعَرْشِ And he seated his parents high upon the throne. So this was the level of respect that Yusuf alayhi salam gave to Yaqub um, and his uh, wife or his parents. We'll come to that in a second inshallah. Again, what is very interesting is it shows us the status that Yusuf had in Misr. Right? That he could, um, if he was just a regular person or somebody who had rank, he could not necessarily sit people on the throne, could he? But it shows that Yusuf must have had such a station and respect in Misr that he was allowed to sit or have somebody sit on the throne of Egypt next to him. So it shows the status of Yusuf. Now when the family sees the status of Yusuf, right? Because again, as I just mentioned, he had that power to have somebody sit on the throne next to him. Um, when they saw all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed Yusuf with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَرُّوا لَهُ سجدا. And they fell down prostrating before him. Now this is a very... Um, controversial subject, right? Because is sajda allowed to anybody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We'll come to that. We'll come to that and we'll define what it meant here when they said, وَخَرُّوا لَهُ sujada. And then the rest of the verse continues, وَقَالَ يَا abati. This is what Yusuf says to his father, هَذَا تَعَوِيلُ رُؤْيَايَ مِنْ قَبْلُ قَدْ جَعَلَهَا رَبِّي حَقَّا Remember, 
he says to his father, this is, now when, now this is Yusuf sitting on the throne, he sees 11 of his brothers doing sajda to him, and in some narrations, Yaqub and Yaqub's wife were doing sajda as well. So this is that promise, um, that, that fulfillment of that dream that Yusuf salam saw at the very beginning. Remember, um, if you go back to the beginning or if you remember from the 16th day of Shahr Ramadan, the fourth verse when we begin talking about the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, um, he, it's, the story starts off with a dream. Isn't it? It was in the morning, Yusuf alayhi salam saw a dream and he runs to his father to describe to him this dream. At this time, Yusuf was about seven or nine years old. And the dream is, إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفُ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَتِي إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبًا وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ رَأَيْتُهُمْ لِي سَاجِدِينَ He says to his father, Oh my father, I saw a dream in which eleven planets were doing sajda to me alongside the shams, the sun and the moon. I saw them doing sajda to me. So his father said, don't hide this, don't tell your brothers this dream, keep it to yourself. After all of this happens and towards the end of the story, nearly 95 verses pass by, the ta'wil or the explanation of that dream becomes a reality. Now he says to his father, after watching 11 of his brothers and the father and the wife doing sajda to him, he says, this is the fulfillment of my dream that I had seen a long time ago, hmm? which my Lord has made come true. So there's a very beautiful symmetry that takes place in this entire chapter of the Qur'an. Then Yusuf alayhi salam describes to his father how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been so gracious and kind to him. He says, وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ بِي إِذْ أَخْرَجَنِي مِنَ السِّجْنِ وَجَاءَ بِكُمْ مِنَ الْبَدْوِ مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ نَزَّغَ الشَّيْطَانُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ إِخْوَتِي إِنَّ رَبِّي لَطِيفٌ لِمَا يَشَاءُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْعَلِيمُ الْحَكِيمُ الحكيم. He says, he, yani Allah was certain certainly gracious to me. Yeah? When he brought me out of the prison and brought you over from the desert after that shaitan had incited ill feeling between me and my brothers. Indeed, my Lord is all attentive in bringing about what he wishes. Indeed, he is the all-knowing and the all-wise. There are very beautiful lessons here, if you think about it. The first lesson is um, he recognizes the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very important. We take God for granted in our lives. We don't realize the, the beauty and the, the kindness with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers us. No matter how bad things are going, I guarantee you there is somebody who is going through something worse. And we can always um, find reasons to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is never going to be a time in our life when we don't have a reason to thank God. And it's very important that we remember the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us and thank Him for that. Secondly, He mentions or recalls um, his prison stay, out of all the things that have happened to Yusuf in the course of his life, and there are many things that we have discussed over the last month, he only mentions the prison stay. He doesn't mention the fact that his brothers plotted against him. His brothers threw him in the well. He was taken as a slave. Um, he was um, chased by women and trying to fight. All of these things happened to Yusuf, which were great um, tests for any one of us. But he mentions only that he... Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him out, he brought me out of the prison. And I think this is a very important lesson, is that he's showing us how to let bygones be bygones. Yeah? If he could easily remind his brothers, you remember you threw me in the prison, God helped me with that. He could have said that. Yeah, some of us may have said that. Yeah, remember you did this, but God helped me. This is not the way you let bygones be bygones. Right? When we say, oh, bygones are bygones, you don't ever bring it up again. If you bring it up again, you have not let it go. Right? This is a very important point to understand. You don't have to forget what has happened. 
Yeah, we should not forget. But we don't have to constantly bring it up or never bring it up. Especially if we have mended fences with people. We need to learn to let go of things. And Yusuf salam teaches us this. And this is the akhlaq of Yusuf. Going back, there's two or three different examples. I don't want to recall them again. But we've discussed numerous examples of the akhlaq of Yusuf. And uh, the, the beautiful akhlaq that he had where he never... Um, brought up an embarrassing situation for somebody again to let them face that embarrassment this is the way um, we should treat our family especially our family and anybody else you know um, we do this often with our spouses sometimes right where we'll bring up a mistake that our spouses made maybe like six years ago remember you did this remember you said this it doesn't help a relationship it does not right um, and the same thing happens in all our relationships in life the third thing which is very beautiful about this passage is that he blames shaitan for inciting ill feeling between him and his brothers yeah? He doesn't say, remember you did this to me. No, he said, shaitan made you do this to me. Yeah? This is again the akhlaq of Yusuf salam, where he is lifting direct blame from the brothers. Showing that he had hope in the brothers, he had trust in the brothers. And he is recognizing that it is shaitan who is the one who did waswasa between the brothers and him. And it was shaitan who misled them. Remember when that... In verse number 5, I believe, when Yusuf's father, Yaqub salam, says, don't tell your brothers this dream. Why? Because shaitan will find a reason or an excuse to come between you two. Subhanallah. Look at the symmetry in all that. That it comes back to the end where Yusuf recognizes that it was shaitan. And again, this is the way um, if we are to pick a fault of somebody... And if we are to um, ask somebody or talk to somebody about something that has come between you and him or uh, these two people, reflect it off to shaitan. Yeah? And say, I knew it wasn't you, but it was shaitan that made us fight amongst each other. It's a very beautiful way to reconcile. Because once we put blame on somebody, it's very difficult for that person to then come closer to you. Very difficult. So we deflect and Yusuf salam teaches us how to do that. Fourth very interesting point here is, is he calls Kan'an a desert. He says, um, the verse is, وَجَاءَ بِكُمْ مِنَ الْبَدْوِي Badwi is like a Bedo, like a, a Bedouins walk around in the desert, right? This is where the word Badu comes from. So he calls Kan'an a desert, showing the difference in environment between Misr and Kanaan. It is not the same city. It is a completely different type of city altogether. Um, and then fifth, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very immaculately um, because he realizes that God is in complete control. So from this verse, we pick up so many very amazing and beautiful lessons. Then lastly, Yusuf alayhi salam turns his attention towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and with full recognition and appreciation, he says, Rabbi qad a'ataytani min al-mulki wa عَلَّمْتَنِي مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَدِيثِ فَاطِرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَنْتَ وَلِيِّ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ This is the last verse of the story of Yusuf. Not the last verse of the entire story of the chapter, but of the story of Yusuf, where he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praises him for the kindness that he has shown. He says, my Lord, you have granted me a share in the kingdom and taught me the interpretation of dreams. Originator of the heavens and the earth, you are my guardian in this world and the hereafter. Showing us who our wali is. Remember, there's a... Uh, Ghadir is coming up soon inshallah who is a wali um, he here he addresses that look my wali is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens and in the earth let my death be in submission to you tawaffani musliman wa alhiqni bis salihin and unite me with the righteous now let's discuss some interesting points to reflect upon from the last few verses first is sajda to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed? Yeah. وَخَرُّوا لَهُ sujada. That's the word that is used. خَرُّوا لَهُ sujada, As it's translated, they fell down in prostration towards him. Now, the answer is sajda with the meaning of 
um, ubudiya, yeah, with the intention of ibadah is only reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it can never be done for another being or another creation, anything else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, we have to understand and realize that Yusuf being a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would know this and he would never allow people to do sajda to him in the form of ubudiyah. Yeah? In the sense of worship, he would never allow that to happen knowing that sajda is reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And additionally, Yaqub was a prophet of God himself. Yaqub would not do sajda of ubudiyah to anybody besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So we have to keep that in mind. And I'll quote, then we'll, we'll discuss then what is this sajda, right? Then what is this sajda that they did? If it is not the sajda of ubudiyah, because it cannot be a sajda of ubudiyah. We must always understand that and remember that. And I'd like to read um, Mas'ala 1099 from Sayyid Sistani Hafizahullah, um, things in which sajda is allowed. He says, it is haram to perform sajda for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is haram to perform sajda for anyone other than Almighty Allah. Some people place their foreheads on earth before the graves of the holy Imams. We see this all the time. Yeah? People go to Najaf, people go to Karbala, I see in Sayyid Zainab salam. They do sajda before they enter. If it is done to thank Allah, there is no harm. But if it is not, it is haram to do that sajda. If you are thanking them, for allowing you to come, it is haram to do that sajda. Yeah? But if you are thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is okay. Hence, when people do that sajda, we don't know what their intention is. Right? So you can't go and tell everybody. But it is my opinion, yeah? and it is the opinion of many scholars, that we should refrain from doing those type of sajdas, because it portrays us Shias in a very bad light. Yeah? We see pictures, if you Google it, um, the Wahhabis have pictures of Shias doing sajda in that way, and they say what? Look, they are worshipping the Ahlul Bayt salam. Yeah? So they don't know what it is. Now I am saying clearly uh, what, uh, what is being said is that Ubudiyya Sajda is not allowed. If it is a Shukar Sajda, it is allowed. But if you're going to do Shukar Sajda, face Qibla and do Shukar Sajda. You don't have to face the Dari and do Shukar Sajda. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu <coughs> ala. Therefore the Sajda which is mentioned in this verse the Mufassirun give three reasons or three possible possibilities of what this sajda could be. The first one is that it was a sajda of shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for blessing Yusuf in this station and at the same time a form of respect for Yusuf. That Yusuf alayhi salam had earned such um, a degree in front of God. And this one is the most probable one Though I'm not entirely comfortable with it, but it is the most probable one our Mufassirun say based on a hadith. Um, if this hadith is entirely sahih, then it should add more weight. In the riwayat al warida an ahlil bayt alayhimu salam yaqul kana sujuduhum lillah aw ibadatun lillah kama ja'a fi ba'd al riwayat anna sujuduhum kana ta'atan lillah wa tahiyyatan li Yusuf. Yeah, that this sajda was a form of obedience to God and a form of thanking God, but it was tahiyyatan li Yusuf, um, almost like um, a congratulatory um, message to Yusuf. Now the sajda was for God, but it was for giving Yusuf such a position. Yeah, so the sajda wasn't for Yusuf, yeah, but the reason for their sajda was to thank God for providing Yusuf such a status. Now when you think about it in that way, okay, then it makes a little bit more sense. And even for me, it is a little bit more accepting. The second explanation is that the sajda, as you know, um, before Islam, many of these words existed long time ago. So salah, the word salah existed since the beginning of Arabic. Um, and what it meant was dua, right? Dua. But when Islam came, it changed the meaning of salah to mean what we are doing. 
right? Likewise, before Islam came, sajda meant humility and modesty towards somebody. Yeah? That when you bow down in front of somebody, it was known as a sujood. When Islam came, it said, no, a sujood or a sajda is when you actually put your head on the forehead with your palms and your knees and your toes touching the ground. So what the Mufassirun said that possibly then the sajda which is mentioned here is simply a bow down in thanks and there's nothing wrong with that. However, it doesn't tie in with the words. The word said, وَخَرُّوا لَهُ سُجَّدَ Kharru literally means they threw themselves to the ground in sajda. So that definition or understanding doesn't really happen. The third answer or this possibility is um, that the sajda was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they were facing Yusuf almost like a qibla. Yeah, that he was the representative of God and they were merely facing Yusuf alayhi salam um, to show them that this sajda was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That one plus the first one I believe if we tie them together it gives a better explanation. There is no doubt it is not for ubudiyah purposes. And this is how when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels to do sajda to Adam. It was almost like a qibla towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, nowadays our qibla is the Kaaba. So we face that and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here they were facing Yusuf. Second point, did Yusuf's mother come to Misr? Because he says that he took his parents into his arms. Remember, if we, in the very beginning we said what? Yusuf's mother died. Yeah? Um, in, uh, in the very beginning of his life when he was quite young, a few years old. Um, so most Mufassirun say, or at least some Mufassirun say, that what is meant here is the mother's, his mother's sister. Yeah? Remember, Yaqub married sisters. Yeah? He married two sisters and had 12 children with them. In their um, fiqh, it was allowed at that time. Okay? Um, so, when Yusuf's mother died, his sister, who was also the mother of Yusuf's brothers, um, took the position of her mother. And he, this is what the Quran mentions when he says the parents um, were taken into his arms. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best if she was alive or not. But some Mufassirun say that she wasn't. The third point that, I, that I, we should really remember is what Yusuf alayhi salam says in the end here. He says, um, تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ um, Let my death be as a Muslim in submission to me. <clears throat> this is a very beautiful dua. And a very powerful dua because we should always be concerned how our death is going to be. Um, Su'ul Aqiba is a, very, it's a very major discussion in akhlaq, what is known as Su'ul Aqiba. Su'ul Aqiba it means a terrible ending. Terrible ending meaning that your whole life may be in one way, <clears throat> but you die as a kafir. Yeah? And this is known as Su'ul Aqiba um, because whatever is in your heart will manifest itself at the time of death. This is a point that constantly is being mentioned in the books of Akhlaq. If you have hypocrisy in your hearts, that hypocrisy will bear itself when you are dying. If you have stinginess, that stinginess will bear itself when you are dying. I remember my family members always tell me a story that my uncle was called, and I may have said the story here as well. Um, he was called to uh, the house of somebody who was in the last stages of death and could not pass that stage of death. Yeah? And he was suffering in that Sakrat al maut for a very long time. And when he came to his house, the children called him over, he looked at his condition. And when he looked at him for a while, he said, does your father have anything that he has been holding on to dearly his whole life? Something that he's, you know, he's so protective and possessive about. And he says, yes, there is a case of jewelry. Yeah, that my father has, that when my oldest brother was getting married, he had promised it to him, but never gave it to him. Then the second one, never gave it to him. Third one, never gave it to him. And he's been holding on to it since then. My uncle said, bring it to him. Yeah? They brought it to him and they put it on his chest and as soon as they did, he died. Yeah, why? Because his mind was stuck to dunya the entire time. Yeah? Stuck to dunya. And this is what's known as Su'ul Aqiba. And here Yusuf alayhi salam teaches us the importance of praying for Husnul Aqiba. That it doesn't matter how I'm living my life right now. Yeah? Look at Hur. Yeah? Look at all of these stories we know. It's how you die. 
is what matters. Yeah? We are living our lives right now preparation for death and afterlife. Yeah? We cannot forget how we are going to die and this is something that is very important for us to remember. Now, we are done. Alhamdulillah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There is still up to verse 111. I'm just going to read it now. Okay, because there's no time to go for explanation. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after finishing the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, um, turns his speech towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And he says to him, O my O the Prophet of God, these are accounts of the unseen which we reveal to you. And you are not with them when they conspired together and schemed. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is here is, look, um, the story of Yusuf alayhi uh, salam uh, is prevalent in the Torah, in the Torah, in the Torah of the Jews. Yeah? It is there, but not in this much detail. Yeah? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look, ya O Prophet, this is hujjah yeah, against these people. Because you are now describing the story in such a detail and you are not there at that time. You are not there to see the conspiracy and the scheming of the brothers, yet you are able to describe to them the story of the Prophet in such great detail. Yet most people will not have faith however eager you should be. Yeah? So here we get a little glimpse into the Prophet. He was very eager to have people fall into Iman, to come into Iman. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, but most people will not have faith. Even if you provide them with the truth, yeah, they um, will not believe. And this is one of my favorite verses. alayhim andartahum am lam tundirhum la I love this verse. Um, even if you warn them or you don't warn them, they will not believe. Yeah? And you will know these type of people when you meet them. When they begin to discuss with you and you begin to discuss with them, in the first few minutes of that discussion, you will know that this is going to waste my time. Yeah? And right away Allah says, Sawaun alayhim andartahum am lam tundirhum la yu'minun. They will not believe, even if you warn them or you don't warn them. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them, O Prophet, even if you take this story in this detail, yeah, they will still not believe, no matter how eager you are. But this eagerness shows the heart of the Prophet, how he wanted people to be saved. He did not want anybody to go to Jahannam. He wanted everybody to enter Jannah. You do not ask them for any reward. It is just a reminder for all the nations. How many a sign there is in the heavens and the earth that they pass by while they are disregardful of it. And you see the signs of God everywhere yeah? but yet we have taken God for granted yeah? how many of us reflect upon that which has happened um, and that which we see around us I was on vacation yeah? um, I have lived now what 35 years yeah? I've never seen a sunrise in my life yeah? never seen there's buildings everywhere where am I gonna see a sunrise from yeah but we were at a place where we could see a sunrise you know how amazing that was to see a sunrise a sign of God. We take the sun rising, I've seen what? Multiply 35 times 365. That's how many days I have seen in my life. Yeah? I have taken the sun coming up for granted. Yeah? But to see it rise, it is a sha'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And how many of us, God says, most of you do not believe even though you see these signs in front of you. How many of us have thought about that? Seriously, maybe you have, you are better mu'mineen inshallah. But that this sun rising, subhanallah, what a task it would be for me. Yet God is so easily and happily doing it for us even though we do not believe. Do they feel secure from being overtaken by a blanket punishment from Allah or being overtaken by the hour suddenly when they are unaware? Say, yani, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Qul hadihi sabili ad'u ila Allah ala basiratin ana wa minat tabi'ani wa subhanallahi wa ma'ana minal Mushrikeen, say, this is my way. I and anyone who follows me invite to God through insight. And we don't invite through God blindly. 
Yeah? When you believe in God, it is through your intellect that you believe in God. That your heart, you believe in God. It is not enough just to say, I believe in God. Glory be to God, I am not one of the polytheists. We did not send any apostles before you, except as men to whom we revealed from among the people of the towns. Have they not traveled over the land so that they may observe how was the fate of those who were before them? Um, there is ancient civilizations which we can see the adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still there till today. Yeah? You go to Greece, you go to these different um, ancient cities, you see even in Syria and all these places where the civilization has been there for a long time, you see the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and how the effect of that was. God is saying, look, go, take a look. I am not joking. I can do this to you at any time. And the abode of the hereafter is surely better for those who are god weary do you not apply reason into your lives? Yeah? So this is how Allah um, ends this verse. Um, and in the last two verses, when the apostles lost hope, and they thought that they had been told, uh, and they thought that they had been told lies, our help came to them. And not the apostles thought that they had been told lies. Yeah? There wouldn't be an apostle then. Yeah? The people, the people had thought that they had been told lies, no matter what they did, they did not believe. Our help came to them and we delivered whomever we wished and our punishment will not be averted from the guilty lot. Um, this is the last verse and this is the very beginning what we had started from. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَالتَّفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ there is certainly a moral in their accounts for those who possess intellect. Yani in the stories of the prophets. If you ponder over the stories of the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there is a moral effect that can take in your life. There is a great lesson that can be learned. This Quran is not a fabricated discourse. Rather, it is a confirmation of what was revealed before it and an elaboration of all things, subhanAllah, and a guidance and mercy for a people who have faith. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that this is, um, there is certainly a moral in their accounts, yani in the accounts of the prophets. Likewise, as we know, there is morals in the accounts of the Ahlul Bayt salam, And there is no greater lesson and story that we can take um, than from the lessons that take place on the plains of Karbala. We know that when we look at the tragedy of Karbala, we can apply... And it is my belief that the entire spectrum of akhlaq can be seen in Karbala. And whatever lesson you want to take, you can find it and you can better your life from the tragedy of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. One of these lessons is the, the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The satisfaction with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can see this in the most innocent way. It is said that on the day of Ashura, when there was nobody left besides Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he shouted out as a warning to all of mankind Hal min nasiri yansuruna? Hal min mughithin yughithuna? Is there anybody to help us? Is there any aid to come in our way? At that time, a loud commotion and tears came out from the tents of the the ladies. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam went towards the tents and he asked them and he said, I am still alive. Why do you cry in this manner? It is said that, oh, the, oh Imam, Ya Aba Abdullah, that when you said, Hal min nasiri yansuruna, Ali yun al Asghar from his cradle began to turn from side to side. That Ali yun al Asghar was shouting out to you, Labbaik, Ya Hussein, Labbaik, Imam al Hussein. Takes Ali ibn al Asghar in his arms. He turns to Umm Kulthum and he says, Oh, my sister, after my death, I leave this baby of mine in your amana. I leave him in your care. Umm Kulthum replies, Oh, my brother, Ali ibn al Asghar has not had water for nearly three days. Why don't you go and take him and ask the enemies to even give him a few drops of water? 
It is that Imam Al Hussein salam, went towards the enemies and he said that what I have done, what you have against me is against me. But what has this young baby done that has made you stop giving him water? As we know, what happened is what happened. The Lain Hurmala shot an arrow and this arrow pierced the neck of Ali Yunil Asghar. But what is very sad is that when Imam Al Hussein salam, came back, not knowing what to do with the body of Ali Yunil Asghar, how can he give his mother this baby who, who has had an arrow stuck to his throat at this time Sukaina runs out and she says <coughs> And she says, Ya Abata, Ya Abata, did my brother get any water? And is there any water left for us to drink as well? <laughs> we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our Imam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the sins of our parents and our loved ones. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who are going through difficulty that he end their difficulty. For those who have asked us to remember them in our prayers, Ya Allah, please accept their hajat. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Rahimallahu mankara suratil mubarakatil fatiha tasbikuha bis salati ala muhammad wa ali muhammad. Allah. Ma sajjala muhammad wa